What up, HyperChange? Welcome to another episode. Today, we're gonna to be discussing Tesla and specifically its proposed acquisition of Maxwell Technologies and why I believe this could extend Tesla's lead in battery technology from where I'm estimating two to three years ahead of other auto OEMs today. But if they integrate uh, Maxwell's dry battery electro technology, I believe Tesla could position itself five to seven years ahead of every other electric vehicle or just auto OEM in terms of battery technology, costs, performance, etc. Fundamental driver of the intrinsic value of Tesla is their manufacturing expertise in batteries, and it looks like they just got way, way better at that by acquiring a breakthrough technology from Maxwell. Now, this is an acquisition that was announced for $218 million about a month ago. I put out two videos on it, um, doing explaining it, trying to you know think through why Tesla would do this. Tesla very rarely makes acquisitions, so it's uncharacteristic to see them do it, and when they do it, there's something behind it. There's some deep tech that they can't develop internally that they want, and that's why they acquired Maxwell. So I did buy te more Tesla stock today because I'm so pumped and confident. Um, uh, the more research I've done on Maxwell, that if this deal goes through, I think there's huge potential and implications for the future of Tesla and potentially cementing the bull thesis um, and, and ramp of, you know, domination of the electrics of the Model Y, the Model 3, the Tesla Semi, and potentially enabling a future generation of Tesla vehicles to have 400 plus miles of range, um, better battery life cycles. And these are things that their competition just will not be able to catch up with or compete with um, because they have acquired this technology from Maxwell. Before we get to into what the technology is and why, SEC filings, first principles, of course, there is some incredibly juicy stuff that has come out that I've seen no one cover, or except for a Maxwell investor who is an institutional shareholder of Maxwell, has been following the company for years. I've been talking to him. Um, he's informed me a ton about the company and about the technology they're developing, and he pointed me to this Schedule 14-9D filing filed on February 20th, 2019, which basically goes through the entire playbook of how this merger went down, and it is fascinating. So first for this episode, I'm going to break down how this merger actually happened on the back end, and then I'm going to go into what, why I think Tesla made the acquisition, how they're going to integrate this technology, and what that's going to mean for the consumer-facing products that Tesla has, and then at the end, why this has me so excited and caused me to actually buy more stock today. So let's get right into it. So this is the 14.9D that was filed on 2-20. Um, I've never even heard of this filing before, um, but this is why you got to be doing your homework and read the SC filings. There is so much juicy stuff in here. So page one of the offer, um, they basically outline the terms of the deal. Um, Tesla has agreed to acquire Maxwell Technologies for $4.75 a share. And they're paying in Tesla stock and not cash. So for those of you worried, they will be diluting a little bit, but $200 million based on Tesla's $50 billion market cap. We're looking at very, very minor, almost immaterial dilution um, for this acquisition. But the technology they have acquired here could have a significantly material impact on their product roadmap. I'm going to put a link to the description of this SEC filing so in the show notes. So you can totally check it out yourself. I recommend it. This is page 18. Page 18 to 30 is where the juicy stuff is. Back Background of the office off offer in the merger. Um, it starts saying, over the past several years, Maxwell's had periodic commercial related discussions with Tesla in connection with potential opportunities between the two companies. In mid-2018, Tesla and Maxwell began a series of discussions in connections with a potential strategic commercial partnership. So for years, Tesla has been negotiating with Maxwell and discussing them, you know, how they can partner in terms of technology. Then on September 20th, 2018, um, Maxwell engages Barclays, the investment bank, to basically, to basically prep the company um, or explore strategic options options of selling different parts of the business or the company as a whole. This is a sign that's very traditional and standard uh, in the finance world. When a company hires an investment bank to explore alternatives, they're basically putting up sort of, it's like hiring a real estate broker to put your house up for sale kind of. Um, and that's what they did on September 20th. Moving to October 2018, Maxwell receives a non-binding offer from Renaissance Management to buy 100% of its Maxwell SA and its high voltage product line. If we go back, what I think is so interesting is there's a tidbit here that basically says, um, Maxwell board also determined that a strategic sale of the high voltage product line would situate Maxwell for a potential strategic transaction in the future as the high voltage product line was non-complementary to Maxwell's energy storage product lines and the technology that was under development. So it looks like they wanted to get rid of this high voltage product line. So that's what happens in October, 2018, they receive a nine binding offer to get to uh, have the high voltage line be acquired. Then December 12, 2018, this is when things start heating up. Brian Shelf Selfo of Tesla contacts the CEO, Dr. Fink of Maxwell, um, that says they want to explore a potential acquisition of the company. 
um, and that is how it starts. And then we get into December 14th. They agree to have a mutual sort of NDA that they're going to begin negotiations to have an acquisition discussion. Then on December 14th, Tesla right away turns around and delivers a non-binding letter of intent to acquire 100% of Maxwell for 235 a share. That was the original offer, where it represented just a 15% premium to the closing price of Maxwell. Maxwell, December 16th, says, look, no, that's not going to cut it. Um, we're going to need a, a much higher offer, most likely, to be able to get a deal to close. Then on December 18th, right after they get the official bid from Tesla, they approve the sale of the high voltage product line. Um, so they're basically now streamlining just in this sort of ultra capacitor battery company um, situation, um, which makes them a more attractive acquisition to Tesla. Between uh, December 17th and 19th, um, the CEO officially informs Tesla that they will need to increase their offer to be able to uh, have a sale. And December 20th, uh, a bunch of senior business personnel from Tesla go down to visit Maxwell at the Maxwell headquarters to have a meeting, conduct some due diligence. Following the meeting on December 20th, Mr. Selfo, uh, on behalf of Tesla, revises the offer to acquire Maxwell, and they rebid the price at a 56% premium to the closing price, purchase offering 235 per share. So just a couple days ago, they offered 235. Maxwell sells no. Then Tesla offers 310. Then what happens next? Um, on after December 22nd's board meeting, uh, Mr. Fink or Dr. Fink, the CEO of Maxwell, informs Tesla that that would need a higher price to be able to get the transaction to go through. Between December 23rd and 28th, they have numer numerous email correspondences to try and negotiate about the transaction. And during this period, Mr. Shelfo also conveyed that Tesla was no longer interested in a potential strategic commercial arrangement with Maxwell and it would move in a different direction should Maxwell and Tesla be unable to reach an agreement regarding the potential acquisition of the entire capital of Maxwell stock. So this is sort of, uh, I don't know, I think it's legal corporate blackmail in a weird way of basically saying, if you don't, if we don't buy you outright, we're probably going to stop buying your products at all, which if Tesla's a big customer of Maxwell sort of backs Maxwell into an interesting corner. Then um, after on December 28th, after convening with the board, um, uh, Maxwell comes back to Tesla and says, look, we're going to need at least a price of $5.75 to $6 per share to win the support of our largest institutional investors to get this deal to go through. Then on January 7th, Dr. Shelfo uh, the, the Tesla comes back with a counter offer saying 435 per share, which represents a 75% premium to the closing price of Maxwell stock. Communicate between the 7th and 10th, and doc, Dr. Fink, the CEO of Maxwell, says, look, 435, way higher than your 235 original offer, but still not going to cut it for the board of directors. Then on the 8th, Barclays presents management, uh, Maxwell, Maxwell's board with a document that says there's two potential acquirers of Maxwell, one of which is Tesla, so it looks like Barclays sort of did their job trying to bring another party to the table here. On January 11th, there's another visit from Tesla senior personnel at Maxwell's headquarters. And then at the end of that, they said on that visit, Mr. Sh moreover, Mr. Shelfo indicated that while Tesla may consider any counter proposal from Maxwell, any higher proposal from Maxwell may cause Tesla to discontinue discussions and explore any and all alternative solutions available to Tesla, including alternatives that were simultaneously being considered or in development at Tesla. So once again, Tesla's basically saying like, look, this is pretty much our final offer. If you even come up with a counter pitch because you don't like this one, we may even consider dropping you, uh, dropping from buying your products, period. January 14th, it looks like uh, Dr. Fink goes back to his board of directors and says, look, okay, this is the deal with Tesla. It looks like if we don't sign a deal with them, they may cancel their contracts with us and we may lose that revenue. So he informs the board of that. Then on the 16th, based on a number of factors reviewed by the Maxwell board, Maxwell turns around to Tesla and says, okay, how about 475? Here's our counter offer. Then on January 18th, a member of the Maxwell board contacted another company Maxwell had a strategic relationship relationship with to see if they would be interested in, a, in a, uh, acquiring the company. They remained, they were very interested in a strategic collaboration and, and partnership with Maxwell, but they didn't actually want to acquire them outright. That same member of the board of directors also contacted two strategic partners, company B and F, to try and get them to buy or do a counter bid to Tesla. Neither of them responded to the company. Then from January 17th to the 22nd, it looks like Barclays does its own DD and starts hitting up company C and company D and company E to try and get them to see if they're interested in buying Maxwell. So the, basically they, they put this counter offer to Tesla and said, okay, we'll do the deal for 475. But on the back end, Maxwell is, is hitting up every strategic part that they know to try and get another bid for the deal. But nobody actually follows through and submits a concrete bid. And I'm gonna talk about why later. 
Then on January 18th, um, they delivered the revised non-binding non letter of intent, basically saying that we want to buy 100% of Tesla for the share price of 475. Although this was lower than the initial 575 to $6 that Maxwell's board had wanted, it was a 66% premium relative to the closing price. So they uh, realized that was a fair deal. Then they decide all these, you know, very ne nuanced terms about the, the exact specifications of what Tesla stock is trading at. How do we calculate how many shares Maxwell shareholders get? Um, but basically it's going to be locked at around four. $4.75 for Maxwell shareholders, but it depends what Tesla's trading at for how many shares those Maxwell shareholders actually get. On February 3rd, they actually uh, signed the definitive merger agreement. Then on the morning of February 4th, it hits the press release. We all found out about it. I make my videos. Tesla is acquiring Maxwell or is intending to for about $218 million. Now lower in the filing, they start to do this extrapolation of, look, okay, we had the board estimate our financials from 2019 through 2023 with Tesla involved to just sh present this to the management. And they publish this here and it's super, super interesting. And then on the next page, I've combined them here. There's another table which says, you got to read this very carefully. The following table represents the pre presents the projections, which are unaudited, which were extended for the calendar year 24 to 25 and updated to take into account recent developments, including the removal of any re potential revenue based on a commercial agreement with Tesla while adding in forecasted amounts for potential alternative automotive manufacturers. So basically what that's saying is this revenue line on the bottom, we have what they would be without Tesla. On the top, they have what they would be doing with Tesla. But there's the caveat here. It's not just Tesla that's the difference. And this is my biggest question mark is they have that last little line there the removal of any potential revenue based on a potential commercial arrangement with Tesla while adding forecasted amounts for potential alternative automotive manufacturers. So maybe Tesla had some sort of ex exclusive agreement and they were like, okay, if Tesla doesn't do that exclusive agreement, we can probably sell the technology to someone else. So we'll price in that revenue. So the difference in these models is without Tesla, but adding in other automotive manufacturers. Super confusing, I know, but that's the deal. Anyway, now we're gonna go on a comparison. So the first year, it looks like 20 million. So at least Tesla was planning to contribute or Maxwell was estimating that Tesla would contribute at least $20 million of revenue to Maxwell. Is this ultra cap? Is this DBE? I don't know. You tell me. We're going to try and figure that out. And if we go to annualize the difference here between every single year, it's 20 million, then 15 million, then 60 million, then 68 million, then 59 million. We add that up. That's 222 million in theory of minimum revenue that Tesla was going to generate for Maxwell over the next five years. This is where I start to get very confusing and we're going to try and put the pieces together because Tesla's paying $218 million for Maxwell. So, but according to this estimate, they were going to do about $222 million. They were going to pay Maxwell $222 million over the next uh, five years for their products. So why would you spend $220 million outright to buy them now when you were only going to buy $220 million worth of their products over five years? Something just doesn't add up. Like it, it seems like Tesla, if they're going to pay $200 million, this is something that is going to produce billions or at least $500 million of value. You know, not, so I'm a little bit confused on that, but then we also have the X factor of how much revenue did they add in on this bottom uh, table for other auto OEMs? You know, is it 300 billion in revenue that Tesla was going to generate? Is it 400? Um, we just don't really know. So tying this all together, I'm trying to figure out what is Tesla buying Maxwell for? Is it the ultra capacitors? We know Elon Musk has a fascination with ultra capacitors and was trying to do his PhD on them for next generation technologies of electric vehicles. And he said they have a lot of potential as sort of the future of energy storage devices and electric vehicles in general. So uh, on one hand, Elon Musk has talked up and hyped up ultra capacitors, but I don't think that's actually why they bought Maxwell. But first of all, let's run through the Q3 2018 earnings conference call, the last conference call Maxwell had with its investors, um, which took place in late 2018 because there's some interesting readouts about their, these two pieces of the business. With our game-changing Geely Volvo solution, we demonstrated the bet the benefit that ultra capacitors solutions can provide to support a heightened demand of the growing electric functions and vehicles. We continue to see interest, increasing interest in Maxwell's range of automotive solutions, primarily in peak power, autonomous driving, e-active suspension applications. Each of these are large market opportunities for us with the technologies, uh, technology and solutions we are developing. We believe we have a strong offering competitive advantage. So why I highlighted this, and this transcript is from Seeking Alpha, so their typos are on them. But what I, what I think is interesting is they basically say like Geely and Volvo which is an automotive company for their futuristic EV platform is planning on buying the ultra capacitors. And if you go into one of their slide decks, you can see that this is a hundred million dollar contract um, over the life of the deal that they wanted to sign with Geely. And to me, this validates that there's some sort of use case for ultra capacitors in EVs. But 
On the flip side, the electrical engineer I talked to estimated that it would cost thousands of dollars to be able to put an ultra capacitor in a car that would be, you know, around 30 to 40 grand. And so the, the economics don't add up. Anyway, we'll get more into that later. But they also say, um, we are also feeling increasingly confident in an additional opportunity in a peak power application where our ultra capacitor solution could be utilized in a standard feature on the vehicle platform, thus providing for considerable volume that could further proliferate and drive material growth in 2020 and beyond. So not only is Geely trying to, and Volvo, which is the same thing, trying to buy these ultra capacitors for their futuristic electric vehicles, but there's also another partner that wants to do the same thing that's going to begin ramping in 2020 and beyond. Is that Tesla? I don't know. The other thing they say in the conference call is the DBE technology. We are in advanced discussion with some OEMs for our dry battery electro technology. Next, let me provide an update on our dry battery electro technology, which I believe is the future crown jewel for our company. Execution on refining our patented technology and a scale up of our cell building capabilities is progressing according to plan and creating significant long-term opportunities. Product samples delivered to potential partners are being very well received and new business activity is growing. Understand this is a longer term mission for Maxwell and it will take time for revenue to materialize, but when it does, we expect it to change the landscape of the company. We have already initiated to scale up all of pilot line. We are preparing to accelerate investment immediately following the execution of a commercial ag agreement with a new partner. Then they end the conference call or the prepared marks by saying our dry battery electro technology in particular is a vital part of our future and it's most promising of the ventures we are pursuing. So they are basically saying this is our game changer. We have validated it on the pilot level programs. So if you remember in the Tesla uh, shareholder meeting or one of the conference calls in mid 2018, they referenced their, their strategy for implementing these battery breakthroughs. There's all these different people claiming that battery breakthroughs, hyping them up that you read about all the time in the news. But Tesla is actually one of the leading battery companies in the world in terms of production technology. So they're monitoring all of these projects constantly. And then once one of these projects shows promise, they're happy to test and validate that uh, technology. And if they test and validate it and it works, then they're going to jump on it and start using it. So that is, in my opinion, exactly what happened with Maxwell. In Q1, they, they say that this auto OEM is showing huge interest in the DBE technology. In Q2, they actually bring in their own chemistry to test um, on this uh, new DBE technology to make sure it works. And they want to hit certain requirements to be able to go ahead and move forward with a sort of pilot plant production of the DBE technology. Then in Q3, this is what I was reading on the conference call, they executed the pilot plant to verify that this could be mass manufactured. So this exactly fits with the pattern of what Tesla would do to validate a breakthrough battery technology. So my opinion is, you know, throughout 2018, Tesla has been slowly testing, you know, more and more of its materials at a bigger and bigger scale with the Maxwell at the dry battery electrode to validate that it works before purchasing the company outright. And why is the dry battery electrode technology such a big deal? Why is Tesla so pumped about this? The biggest thing here is they have validated in the pilot test, according to what I'm reading, that they can hit an energy density of over 300 watt hours per kilogram. Why is this a big deal? The electrical engineer I talked to and the consensus I've done from Googling is Tesla is from 210 watt hours per kilogram to 250 watt hours per kilogram for their cars today. Let's assume the max 250 watt hours per kilogram. And let's say that Maxwell's technology is only validated at 300 watt hours per kilogram. That's a 20% increase in efficiency. So, and these calculations, I'm not an expert. I talked to someone who is more knowledgeable than me. So please correct me if I'm wrong. But my understanding of that means that 20% more efficient, let's let's say that they're at $100 per kilowatt hour at the pack level for an 80 kilowatt hour battery pack for the long range model three. That means if they have this 20% reduction in efficiency, that same battery pack could go down to an $80 kilowatt at the cell level. This means that they could save on average $1,100 per car per battery pack for the long range model three. I mean, that's a huge, huge difference. And from my understanding, you know, there's a lot of ways to do this. You could, because the, the, the dry battery electro technology means there's smaller, more efficient cells, you could cram more cells and do more range, or you could build a smaller battery for cheaper. So this technology is incredibly, incredibly uh, amazing. And for those who don't know what the DBE technology is taking a step back, I covered this in my previous videos, but it's basically a new way to manufacture batteries without um, previously the, the industry status what Tesla uses is wet battery electrodes which they have to put all these chemical solvents on and then dry them in these massive ovens. The dry battery electrode doesn't need the solvent which is incredibly toxic to the environment so the sustainability of the battery is vastly improved but also they don't need these huge drying ovens which vastly reduces the square footage needed in the battery plant um, for this production. So they've, they're reducing you know it's they're simplifying it they're taking
taking away a, a very expensive chemical and they're making it faster and they're making it use less square footage. I mean, this is a game changer for a company that owns the Gigafactory, which is the largest battery production facility in the world. And this is the secret sauce of why you may be saying like, okay, if this is such a game changer, why is, you know, why is no other auto OEM doing this? Why is Rivian not buying it? Why is GM not buying it? Why is BMW not buying it? Because none of them are as vertically integrated as Tesla and producing as many BEVs or as, you know, integrated at this battery pack level. Because Tesla is producing the most battery packs out of all these people, they will achieve the fastest ROI by implementing this technology. And therefore, financially, no matter how you model this, you know, Tesla, it makes the most sense for Tesla to buy them first because they're going to be able to implement this on a wider range of cars and, you know, have a high, have that higher ROI. But then there's a whole nother battery breakthrough that is actually unrelated to Maxwell that I wanted to briefly mention, which is that Tesla has contracted this guy by the name of uh, Jeff Don, who is a battery researcher who used to work for 3M, but now has a 20-year agreement for to do R&D for Tesla. And he basically patented this new cell that only would use two additive electrolyte systems um, instead of five, which means it's vastly simpler battery chemistry, also improving range and efficiency. Why this patent is so interesting is because he wrote another article, which I think is related, that says, is cobalt needed in nickel uh, rich positive electrode materials for lithium ion batteries? So there's a potential here where Tesla has also been altering the, the chemistry of its cells to reduce the usage of cobalt or basically eliminate the reduced usage of cobalt, which is the most contested uh, material in Tesla cars because the way they extract it is, is, isn't that ethical and the prices are subject to fluctuations and you're relying on these weird foreign countries to get your supply. So there's huge humanitarian and supply chain risks for cobalt. So on the back end of this, we have Tesla that's developed a cobalt-free uh, technology, it looks like, or they're working on it. And that cobalt-free technology, because the DBE can be used with any sort of chemistry, could be applied to the DBE. So we actually have two sort of crazy breakthroughs going on at Tesla at once, or innovations, which is first, the DBE technology, then second, this new chemistry, which they can, you know, they're not dependent on one another, but from my understanding, they can be combined. And this combination of the cell is going to put, is what puts Tesla five to seven years ahead uh, of the competition here. I mean, they're going to have batteries that are longer range, way longer lasting, way cheaper to make, um, way less environmental impact. That is the bottom line. Those are, you know, I can't, it's, it's almost like the stats of Tesla's batteries are getting so much better, you know, all around. So moving back to the ultra capacitors, this is something that I speculated that Tesla will be working on a hybrid ultra capacitor lithium ion car. But after discussing, you know, with people who are far more advanced in this than me, it sounds like the cost to actually buy these ultra capacitors would be incredibly expensive versus this minor ROI that they put on the performance of the vehicle. And unless there's a drastic pace of innovation in uh, ultra capacitors, or they can, Tesla can hugely bring down the production costs by scaling up, uh, you know, economies of scale at the Gigafactory, then I don't think it economically makes sense for ultra capacitors, or that's what my research says. Regardless of ultra capacitors, I think the DBE technology is a game changer here. And where I'm still, something's not adding up to me is I'm like, okay, so the revenue difference from Maxwell's projection is only 222 million. But how, what, stra you know, is that a, does that assume Tesla licenses the DBA technology? Am I wrong? And is that just Tesla buying ultra capacitors for the Roadster and the Semi um, from Maxwell and that's no DBE in there? Or is, are they just vastly underestimating the potential of DBE? Like I have no idea if Maxwell can deliver and Tesla can implement this technology that's 300 watt hours per kilogram, then we have a game changing step function in, in Tesla, whether that means they wanna reduce the cost or increase the range of their cars, maybe they'll do both. But but that is what the excitement is. And what's even more crazy is if you look at this slide, they don't want to stop there. Maxwell eventually says that they see a path to be able to get to 350 plus kilowatt uh, watt hours per kilogram uh, by 20 by the early 2020s. And eventually they validated a path to 500 watt hours per kilogram. So this is what has me so excited about Tesla and, and, and Maxwell Technologies and everything going on here. To sum it up, you know, Tesla has acquired this tiny little company um, in San Diego that has developed something called the dry battery electro technology. They've piloted it, they've tested it, they've tried to manufacture it at scale and it works. And the second Tesla realized it worked, they, they went from trying to partner with Maxwell to buy the company outright because they realized that they could integrate this in their manufacturing operations and this will save them a huge amount. This will allow them to reduce the cost of productions while increasing range, while increasing battery life cycles 
I mean, Tesla already to me has the most high quality EVs and battery packs on the road, and that is not using this dry battery electro technology. So this is a game changer. This is, you know, significant cost reductions. I believe Tesla will announce when they close this acquisition, the implications of this technology. And I'm waiting for that because I think once the industry realizes how big of a deal this is, um, people are going to realize that Tesla is not, you know, other OEMs are not catching up to Tesla. No, no, no. Tesla's getting further ahead. And that is what has me so excited. That is why I bought more stock today because I've changed in my mind of, of you know, I think the competitive advantage if this deal closes is, is only increasing for Tesla. And that's not something that I previously thought. And so I think it's a game changer. Um, anyway, so I hope this rant makes sense. I tried to cram a ton of info on a subject that I'm not an expert on. I'm the part of the reason I'm making this is because I wanted to share all my thoughts with you and get comments feedback. Like if you know this, if correct me if I'm wrong, please share all of your ideas with this. It's a team effort for the DD. All of the comments that I've been getting from the previous videos and emails and these calls have been incredibly informative. So thank you to everyone who's put in the work to help this research. Um, but I'm super, super excited about this. And while the market is focusing on everything going on at Tesla right now, you know, me as a long-term investor who uses a technology company who really needs to refine their core expertise in manufacturing the best and cheapest battery packs in the world, if that's really their bread and butter that's that's going to release you know the power wall make the power wall better that's going to make the semi better it's going to make the roadster faster it's going to make the model y be able to be cheaper to produce you know if that core technology keeps improving my thesis and my confidence in tesla only increases and that is why this technology is going to spread to every facet of tesla's business and now tesla bought it and no one else can use it and the reason why nobody else is buying it or figuring out and every person that barclays hit up said no is because they didn't build the gigafactory they're not all in on electric vehicles so they're not going to be able to realize this, the, the savings, this technology isn't worth 200 million to them for years until they scale up their EV programs. But Tesla's already scaled up, so the technology's worth it, so the ROI's there, so they're gonna make the deal. And that's why I don't think anybody's gonna come in and outbid them because it doesn't make sense. So I don't know, I'm stoked. I think Maxwell is a huge deal. I think nobody's paying attention. I think you should read this filing. Keep doing homework on Maxwell. I will as well. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is HyperChange. Huge shout out to our Patreon supporters, producers, fun in the channel, subscribing to the newsletter. Um, I'll see you guys next time. Peace.